Hi, everyone. Good afternoon to uh, our um, uh, Ice House 17, our, our uh, 17th year of uh, Ice House of, our Ice House of uh, Poetry Weekend events, of which this Ice House launch is one. Um, we've done a few online so far this year, and they've been a lot of fun. Um, and I must say that, you know, there's a real sadness in me that we don't have 50 poets gathered in Mem Hall as we normally do. Um, but I've learned that one of the advantages of these events is that um, people who could never make it to Fredericton can easily tune in and uh, join us uh, and be a part of it. So that's, uh, I, I like that element of it. Um, so I guess uh, uh, given that um, uh, Goose Lane is in Fredericton and um, uh, hosting this event, uh, I would like to uh, begin by acknowledging that the land in which we gather is the traditional unceded territory of the Wallastik and Mi'kmaq peoples. This, ter is, this territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which the Wallastik and Mi'kmaq peoples first signed with the British crown in 1725. <laughs> the treaties did not deal with surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Molesti title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between the nations. And we're uh, still working on that ongoing relationship to say the least. Um, so today we're celebrating the Fredericton launch of three books from Ice House, Tanya Bartel's Everyone at This Party, Chris Hutchinson's In the Vicinity of Riches, and Jesse Jones, The Pool. Um, and joining us as part of Ice House and Friends, as part of, uh, I think, these launches that I've always enjoyed, where we have uh, a few friends join in to read with us. And today um, it's going to be uh, Trini Finley, Sue Sinclair, and Emily Scove Nelson. Um, so this event is part of a virtual Ice House tour. Um, and so we're kind of virtually in different cities. Uh, and if uh, you want to hear more after today, or if you have friends that didn't make it and you want to tell them all about how great it is, um, we'll be in Toronto on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Um, Tanya, Chris, and Jesse will be reading um, together with three poets from uh, the chapbook series of Anne Struther Press, Elizabeth Medeno, Tracy Vitabor, and Franco Cortese, I can probably pronounce a couple of those names incorrectly. So hopefully there'll be some forgiveness. Um, um, after hearing uh, today's Ice House poets, you will no doubt want to buy their books. And in Fredericton, you can get them from Westminster Books by dropping by and uh, getting copies that they have there or by giving them a call at 454 one four four two, and I'll just give you that again. That'll be four five four one four four two. If you're from out of town, support your local bookstore. Okay, <coughs> our first reader today is Tanya Bartel. Um, she's a Vancouver area poet and high school English teacher, um, and she describes her first book as, um, and this is her first collection. Unsentimental and blunt, these poems delve into the suburbs and try to make sense of our private selves, highlighting themes such as our obsession with alcohol, regret, fear, and failure. They accept the arbitrary nature of life and the demons that persist within. Please welcome Tony. Hello from the West Coast. Thank you so much for coming. Just going to change my view here. I can't seem to see myself, <laughs> I'm sorry. There I am. I'll be reading three poems from my book, starting with the title poem, Everyone at This Party. Everyone at this party. Look around. Everyone at this party is someone's horrible childbirth story. I'm either an expert or a one trick pony. Either way, it's taken my whole life. Don't have a favorite cowboy, prefer freedom to the lasso. Crickets kick up their heels, 
in the fullness of the exploding heat, I could hurl this boulder into a slough and it would be there after every current occupant on this planet is dead. Grass along the banks, greens up, yellows down. Water, the most easily influenced substance, doesn't show its age. Fleeting dandelions that never end. It's a miracle, but we don't see it that way. Each new sunrise blinds us and we start over, the same as we were yesterday and the day before. Bitchy in the morning, angry to bed. After we die, people will say we lit up a room when we walked in. Cacorophyophobia is an irrational, persistent fear of failure. I've written a series of phobia poems, uh, fear of um, aging and gaining weight in a fishable profession like teaching. Current phobia two, cacorophyophobia. I feed a careworn buffalo in my sleep. She grazes on my faux paw all night and won't let me rest. I introduced my neighbor as the bastard who parks his motorhome in the cul-de-sac. Now he's erecting a higher fence. Don't worry yourself awake. One day we'll all be released. It's possible to hate someone after they're dead. I do it all the time. The alcoholic's children twice traumatized. Years of yelling, then find him deceased. He is not the only beast. I'm beating my noose to make it pretty. A flat-footed angel comes to take me home. Lilac is not my color. I chop my wedding ring on the cutting board. Resentment has its consequences. A pizza stone can be a weapon or a shield. I sow what I reap. My Venus flytrap is full and you should see what's in the woodshed sometime. One catheter in a lifetime is too deep. I'm afraid to fall asleep. I drank beer in an inflatable, inflatable boat within weeks of nearly drowning in one. If planets are idiots stuck circling the sun, what chance do I have? Criminologists say only pedophiles are incapable of change. Yet the pile of hamburgers sold continues to grow. We're diamonds trapped in the record's rut. I will always love cheese, but there was no Asiago at the gun show. I crave warmth, but knit holes. Build ladders, but can't climb them. Smile, but look medicated. Plant peas, but can't shell them. Adore pizza, but hate the man who delivers it. Keep my pencils sharpened, but to a nub. I groom myself with an oversized hairbrush that shreds my skin into tiny white flags. I'm a shabby cherub. Still, I celebrate myself at the neighborhood pub. My last poem is about how much I hate the noise in the suburbs. There's a very particular kind of noise in the suburbs. Lawn mowers, leaf blowers, family fights. Whisper Street. People are not as friendly as you'd expect 
in places that run on friendliness. Work, parties, work parties. I came to see all co-workers and all party goers as one rude unit and to view myself as an only, a single rude unit. On my street, crumbled clouds, a half-eaten sun, agony rolls underground. Something stings my wrist in the fattest vein and the day ahead itches. I embark on a radiant laziness in an effort to mimic the way of dogs, envying their thoughtlessness. My deaf old dog has hauled, hauled his, himself to sleep, to bed. I'd follow, but for all the noise, 1,000 caged hamsters crack sunflower seeds. My neighbor removes the earth's crust around his property with a pressure washer. Toddler next door screams blue murder that he won't go to bed. A mirror busted in half, rubber gloves snapped off and flung to the tiles. I want to live on Whisper Street where a lounging willow tree soaks up all our consequences where nobody kills dandelions and everyone grows yellow roses that hug one bee per blossom. Violins play from tree houses. No one mows their lawns and laundry blows by like sails down a stream. Green traffic lights that say, you're allowed to keep going but you don't have to. Good luck that won't let me be. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tanya, that was wonderful. Um, our first friend sitting in is Trini Finley, um, who writes about mental illness and psych ward life um, in her new collection, Myself, a Paperclip. And that's forthcoming from Ice House in 2021. So it's a book you'll very much want to look forward to. Please welcome Trini. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ross. And thank you, everyone. It's so nice to see you here. Um, so I'm just going to read. It's a long poem. So I'm going to read three sections, very, very brief sections. The first one is just one line. In the room, the women come and go, talking of the elusive O. Oh. Self-portrait as paperclip. Bent out of joint in order to hold everything together. Won't snap, won't dissolve in an acid bath, but needs to be re-engineered, designed for the shape of the new manuscript it clutches, attached like an infant's latch to a firm, nourishing nipple. Rebent, refined, Redefined as a notch maker, page marker, object in place of a memory. As nothing you'd ever find bundled in bulk at Costco. Striking the pen cap against the printed page, you have to look again. This trinket, so ready to be unfastened. And I'm gonna end with the uh, final poem of the whole collection, which is called Rejected Embroidery Projects. I stitch whimsicareful scenes for people who don't love me back. MSN logo, buy flag, Dr. Mario pills for the 90s kid who left on a work trip that winter and chose not to return. Sun, moon, and rising signs for the Zodiac led trauma specialist who preferred her subtle cats, understood. Whose hands will pick those finished hoops from the nearby dumpster? It's all going to light up eventually. Whose lungs will cave because of the fire? Oh, Aida cloth, stretched and clamped 
and stabbed. I didn't mean to hurt you, to rebirth you as something harsher than yourself. We all know the needle pushes away the pain. Thank you. Thanks, Trini. Um, our next friend sitting in is Emily Scove Nilsson, um, whose uh, first collection just came out uh, below a few scant months ago, it seems. Uh, it's called The Knowing Animals and is published with Brick Books. Please welcome Emily. Thanks, Ross. Um, thanks for having me. So I am going to be reading from my book today. And I think I'll begin by transporting us back uh, briefly to a summer world. Solstice. Bio-green satellites orbiting raspberry canes, twilight, fireflies, 9.59 p.m. Looking through to a spruce split strawberry moon, rosy pink lunar cheek, sculpted catastrophe, meteoric, volcanic, a woman's beaten face. A rare hue for the solstice, says the almanac. Click for more, says the internet. Warm, catabatic winds scroll down the hillside, twisting tall grasses. Sit with me and watch this long black sky, like film smoothed with gelatin and silver halide crystals light sensitive and exposed, revealing the invisible image, a shining cluster of metallic atoms breathed into the world by photoelectron magic. That's photography, baby. Sneak peek behind the scenes, recording radiant energy, drawing with light in keeping with the Greek. I am an alien in the woods, building spacecraft, expanding and trapping consciousness. I am my best and worst fears realized, caught in the gaze of our largest satellite, hypothesized love child of Earth and Thea's red hot collision, the climax of their suspended singularity in space time. So lonely they were until then, like the fireflies flashing their cold luciferin light, or the men and women in dark cars at the Fort Latour parking lot my hometown's puckish hookup spot, blinking their headlights, hoping to hypnotize another, to captivate, as in to catch and hold captive, to watch a strange face whimper and squirm, turn on with the flick of a switch, a shutter held open, a long, sudden exposure. Um, this next poem has uh, a touch of Halloween in it, I think, uh, as it looks at a metamorphosis of sorts that occurs to a mother um, when she leaves the house at night. It's called Going Out. Why are you everywhere in the night? The children ask as I pull on my tights. Your legs look like black snakes, the youngest says, as he brushes my thick, coiled hair. I kiss each of them with my coral lips, welting their skin like a queen wasp before brusquely shutting the kitchen door, locking everyone inside. I walk alone through Stygian streets to feel a part of the day that's unfastened clasp by clasp in the handsy dark, rearranging the way my body does when the dress finally drops. I have a feeling that tonight, one of my friends will get too drunk, spill the wine and tell me that her husband's never made her come. Or maybe I'll shove my hands down a man's pants in a 1 a.m. parking lot. Did you know that the root word of nirvana is blow, meaning blown out? I'll think of this, stumbling home in the pitch of it, while my loved ones dream of worse or better lives. And I'll just read one more. It is a 
short, fast-paced poem. Uh, I've been thinking and reading a lot about mushrooms lately. So this is my playful ode to the Amanita muscaria, uh, the fly agaric mushroom, the one with the red cap and the little white spot. Amanita muscaria. Copper topped, pimple faced. Do the curtains match the drapes? Homeschooled, toadstool, weirdo on the block. Tripped out, whipped out a pocket full of flies. Ate them up like fries. A sicko, a psycho, a fungus fruiting freak show with a teenage mutant glow. Believer in fairies and gnomes. A stay at home, high scoring Super Mario bro lost in a wonderland of shrink and grow. Outraged by your oddity, we formed a gossipy camaraderie. The buzz was that your birth was a monstrosity, a fantastical morbosity. Off the charts you zoomed, skipping the schoolroom doom where we were razzed and ridiculed, secretly wishing we were you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Emily. Uh, thanks very much. Um, our next reader is uh, uh, Jesse Jones, who lives and writes in Montreal, Montreal. Um, and um, The Fool is her debut collection of trees. So please welcome Jesse. Thank you. Um, in other parts of the country. Um, yeah, really, really great to be here. Um, I'm just going to read a few poems from the school, um, the first of which is called Runner, organless, the streets clawed at by frost and the sky, an unripe peach someone rushed to skin. You in track pants outrunning the sunrise, chained to the new year clock grinding down. Each morning you run to the ocean to be crushed by its motion and centerlessness, to be needed for the roots of minutes to stretch. Your desire to be both noticed and left for wolves apparent. Reflective stripes of your lycra coat flash like scrubbed femurs. How long you can go on alone is a skill one hones over years. The forward of your body, the only wholeness it knows. Never an end, only a bend where the bay scoops out all sound but castanets of breath. There, you turn the way an ankle does, sharp and stupid, pitifully inward. Loop your mind's island until you finally overtake the stranger with your face. Um, this next one is called Ex Nihilo which just means out of nothing. The world slides into me through the neck of my coat, bloated by a wet November, slides between the poly blend liner and silk dress, ecru and heedless, a bead and a button by the collar and a dollar's worth of skin at just the right bias. Bend down through bone cask like a soil horizon, sinking gracefully into the memory of a wound, a loose tooth, the gorgeous pain of a tongue tip marooned in a newly vacant plot and its nub of root. In my ears, the sound of a stopwatch gains focus. When I open my eyes, my childhood lies before me like a translucent parachute. When I bring it to my ear, each sound has the skin of apricot, touch, has the taste of oak moss, perfumed anew by alien scents. I cannot stop bowing my head to my wrist. Um, this next one I wrote while I was still living on Vancouver Island. Um, and it occurred to me as I was reading, reading through it again this morning that um, <laughs> There's a lot of poems that I write that are just sort of uh, channels for some short-lived obsession um, that I'm not sure what else to do with. Um, and this is sort of the conflation of two. Um, while I was living in Victoria, I discovered that there's this stretch of coastline from basically the southern tip of Vancouver Island all the way down to Northern California. 
that's called the Graveyard of the Pacific Northwest. Um, apparently it's just a very treacherous piece of water to navigate by boat. And so there have been hundreds of shipwrecks there, um, even up until like the last decade. Um, and around the same time that I was reading about this, um, I was also getting into new music and discovering uh, this composer, Caroline Shaw, who wrote this really beautiful piece of choral music called It's Motion Keeps based on uh, uh, an 18th century hymn, I believe, uh, that's all about time and mortality and the ocean. Um, so it was just sort of a perfect little uh, act of kismet that I found those two things at the same time and was able to write a poem with both of them in it. Um, so yeah, this poem uh, is called It's Motion Keeps, which shares the name with uh, the piece of music that I was listening to at the time. And there's a bunch, right at the beginning, I'm gonna list a bunch of names and those are all the names of the vessels um, or some of the vessels uh, that, um, yeah, tragically uh, sunk uh, in the graveyard of the Pacific Northwest. Count backward from 100 numbering the many failed sailings of the Northwest. Anna C. Anderson, Vandalia, Leonese, Area, Cape Wrath, Orpheus, Marie. I arrive at 93 before the waves crash over me in raucous applause. Count backward from the beginning. Is that the moment when I was packed into a cannon and made a mosaic? or at the base of Tillamook Head, when the gray dog swam out of the bleak water, a gleaming, bullet-shaped extension of the tide. I close my eyes. What other side? The seashells lined with passengers peering through a thick, absorbent mist. The steady side wheels glittering palmfuls of water released like blessings into the night. Flattery flattery, flattery, a landmass they want so free of that they can't see it reaching. If you wake midway and see the surgeon's white cap, remember that this is not rough water. The other side of the other side is a sterilized room where you recover from the former, indents and thumbprints in your impressionable skin. If you distrust its vacancy, recall that the electric blue glaciers teem with its scattered lights. Clouds galled by flames do too. A black box is not a system without a middle. It is a system with an unknown middle and a known end. Um, this next one is called Ego Death. I never established cities upon quotes or washed the orange soles of my feet with lanolin soap and olive oil. I never broke stale bread over my knee or twisted the wine cork out with my teeth. I loved my teeth. I was born with all of them and a pearl of bone to make more. I never saw my own reflection in the startled bog, never lost one boot to it. I never guessed at what it might be like to be saturated with anger, the stench it emits until it's bleached or buried. I never reached into thick bitumen and felt a hand tug me under. I never gave my name or life to work I deserved. I was never unnerved by shadows, creaks, thunder, never saw the wonder of symbols. I would never admit to grief for the dead season or the beakless sparrow my brother found. Yet here I am, long luscious with absence and fear of everything. All the words I never dared to say aloud now dare me to hold the skyline of them down. Syzygy, Monica Viti, Bogota, Solipsist, to refuse Fisher, Scintilla, Lassitude, you. Um, okay, I think this is the last one that I'm gonna read today. Um, and I don't have 
I don't really have anything much to say about it, except that um, there's a mention of poison at some point in, in the poem. And I just wanted to clarify that that is a perfume that my mother wore when I was a kid um, that has like very intense sense memories for me. Um, but this is called Law of Expressed Emotion. Very well. You are doing very well when you are well and also fine. You find your stride in the morning hours when the streets halt and slacken like sleeping limbs. Careful now, careful. The room is spinning because you have no center. Your diet lacks fiber, dark leafy greens and a pink eye of Arizona grapefruit. Your subtractiveness is testament to Newton's first law. Little pushes, that's all. Fineness finds you stock still but borderless, claiming territory in every direction, vying, eyeing a mudslide with a grimy little look, vying for a slick moat of destruction made to look accidental. When you wake numerous, who do you think you are? Old habits take you back as willingly as a dog you fed once. When you wake shattered, a pattern repeating into the distance faster than one can perceive its order, you can choose the mirror. Confront the infinite with your matter-of-fact matter, nose through its chasm like a shiny silver needle. You were once a silent babe awaiting the company of your mother for midnight feeding. You watched the ceiling as though it contained all meaning, which it did. She would appear out of it and raise you to the place that smelled of laundry, wax, and poison. In that model union, your cells swelled in the receiving line of health, and you were fine. A fine-looking child. Everyone said, everyone saw the future for which you are destined under homesick for your own body, trapped in the air. Never again say them, all the words that don't mean it. Arrange your mouth into the exultant grin of a starlet. Feel it. Pick up where you left off as a kid. Wrap your lips around the faucet and quench your thirst with hot sunlight. You were once and will be again. Were once, will again. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Jesse. That was grand. Um, sitting in uh, with us today is Sue Sinclair, who is um, she is the editor of the Fiddlehead, and we will be publishing her selected poems uh, with Ice House in 2022. So please welcome Sue. Thanks, everyone. Um, Thanks for having me, Ross, and many congratulations to this year's Ice House Poets. Uh, it's great to hear you read. Uh, I have two poems I'm going to read. Um, the first one is a mushroom poem. So, <laughs> Emily, I totally loved your fly agaric mushroom poem. Um, for me, writing about mushrooms has started with this book, The Mushroom Fan Club by Elise Gravel. So as well as buying all the Ice House poetry books, <laughs> I recommend and the Mushroom Fan Club, which is a kid's book. Um, and it's like, a, it's like a child's field guide. And I knew nothing about mushrooms. And I learned an immense amount and have continued on since I bought this a couple of years ago, to learn more about mushrooms. Um, so I'm going to read one mushroom poem. This one is for, and you know, yeah, I don't know. The more I read about mushrooms, the more amazed I am by them, as one is amazed by anything that one really learns about, I suppose. Um, Yeah, there are mushrooms that can metabolize nuclear waste. So just for starters, just for starters. Anyway, this one is in the voice of a mushroom ring. It's called Mushroom Ring Chorus, uh, as in, you know, a ring of mushrooms. There are, there's a species of mushroom that does actually grow in these circles, and they can be quite large. They can be like football uh, field-sized rings. A simple inscription, this bent line, a buried O, a figure pursued between the grass's matted roots. The tapestry of our mycelium presses 
through the, the twisting soil, more than up toward your much vaunted sun, replete with so-called oneness, dispersing its singular glory. The sky is not a freedom we seek. Our preference is entanglement, winding our way through the intimacies of the unlit. The circle we form is corrupt, ragged, is not for the sake of the center point, the very idea. That's just where we happen to start out. We, by the way, are not even we, but have chosen from your language the name that comes closest. We creep past our own edges, digesting the lawn, latching on to its feathery roots, white sprawl. And then the second poem I thought I'd try out is a pandemic poem called Hey Nani Nani. Three young men in identical Navy t-shirts perform calisthenics in the woods as the gyms are closed. Gymnastics rings are slung and knotted over a pine branch for pull-ups. One man executes dated deep knee bends. They're beautiful in their pursuit of health and strength in this merry month of May, but alarmingly utopian looking, suggestive of purest attempts to stamp out dissent by way of just such beauty white-skinned and forceful. The sun itself streams parental approval over their shoulders as the ferns and just emerging Canada lilies rise out of the old litter. Why shouldn't they make the most of the day of their 20-something prime? The leopard frogs in the pond nearby are thawing in the mud after a winter spent in a near-death state, frozen to the core. As they slowly return to kinesthetic life, what might they think of these fine specimens of young manliness, of this eerily Volksish return to nature, of their diligent reps? I haven't even mentioned the Adonis butterflies, flashes of blue darting by, opening and closing their wings energetically, empowered by the privilege of light. It's partly the pandemic talking, my fear of the purisms that grow in such times, authoritarians creeping out of chrysalis. The young men have little to do with it. They're packing up, later man. But how much delight and how much dismay? That's what I'd like to know. How can I tell and who do I ask? So that's it for me. Thanks, folks. Thank you, Sue. Um, and bringing us home today is Chris Hutchinson, who's the author of three previous books of poetry, Unfamiliar Weather, Other People's Lives, and A Brief History of the Short-Lived, as well as the speculative autobiographical verse novel, Jonas and Frames, which um, ISOS published uh, a while back. Um, Chris recently moved back to Canada after a decade of studying and teaching in the U.S., um, Arizona, New York, OK, I assume is Oklahoma, Texas, and is now core faculty at McEwen University's English department in Edmonton, Alberta. So please welcome the well-traveled Chris. Hi, everybody. And uh, thanks to, to Ross, thank you so much, and, and uh, Ice House for organizing this. And uh, again, it's great to see everybody's faces. I hope one day to see everybody's faces live face to face, but this will suffice for now. 
Um, I'll read uh, about, I think, three or maybe four short poems and one long poem. It will come uh, under 10 minutes. Uh, the first poem I'll read is called Mobile Fragments Poured Into a Vase. Lemonade instead of limelight. Meth heads of the bowling green unite. iPhones to symposiums like bridegrooms to the invidious ex-duchesses of crash reports. Dear cicatrix in your plasticine pajamas. Coral fossil so amaranth, so honeycomb. Nova Scotian snowbirds, why all these painterly disinfectant cake complexioned selfies? Hey, gentlemanly pantomimic stand-ins, my myrmidons for your multivocal whoop de doos Your acid wash for my razor burn. Uh, milkweed, like mildewed mop heads and acquiescence. Oh, electronic cigarettes, vespers, and then later caterwauling beneath the horrible gymnasium. Uh, this next poem is, uh, it takes uh, its, its form and inspiration from the George Herbert, the uh, 17th century Welsh theologian and metaphysical poet, uh, his poem, Prayer One. Uh, and it also steals uh, Eduardo C. Corral, the American poet, uh, his title, Slow Lightning. And uh, the poem is called Inside the Air. Silent gossip of the actual. Lucy in the sky getting by on cubic zirconia and tricyclic antidepressants. Aeolian spiderweb, Mount Parnassus weather report Vowelless syllables of snow, gravity's waiting room, Amelia Earhart's heart all alone, contents flying dream, forms hidden half truth, avant gardists secret lyric obsession, news that isn't fake and fake news that is, police report on police brutality, drifters blurred roadmap of past mistakes, psychoanalysis of blue velvet, Freudian slip, Orwellian slipknot, mute prayer to words, breath from a bloodied mouth, and all the ways a word can mean inside the darkness of itself, the way slow lightning creeps and high-pitched thunder pings and ricochets inside the air. This poem, um, let's see, is this the one? Yes, it is the one. Uh, you'll notice this last, uh, the last line of this poem, you, you probably will pick up, steal something from W.H. Auden. Um, I'll leave it at that. It's called Everywhere Versus Nowhere, A Poetics. Here is Whitman's silvery beard long since decayed and Auden's oblong tomb vandalized, waylaid, Americanized in reverse. Listen, beside an old Buick, I fell on my face and wept, but Brooklyn slept through it. Once the king of my online domain, now I'm just a first level druid. Now a darkness wakes inside of me and you to whom the darkness would like to speak who left Manhattan for ancient Greece, but wound up in a Saskatoon prison. Your name is like a hoplite's grunt in the air, like a cop's Glock 22 in the sky, like a dare, like the feeling of having no feelings. You are ubiquitous, ephemeral, meaning everywhere you go will follow. Instagram, Twitter, whatever. Poetry's dead. It's always dead. We must live stream one another or die. I thought that's a little apropos. Uh, this next poem is called North American Figures of the Capitalocene or the Capitalocene, which is, um, it's been 
a theorized uh, as a, an extension or a kind of a refinement of the idea of the Anthropocene, uh, where um, people think of uh, the real root cause of our indelible stain on the environment and the geological uh, period really having its, its basis in capitalism and the advent of that kind of economic system. Um, so this is called North American Figures of the Capitalocene. Tell me how you feel, how this figure stoops to live as if to write of suffering were itself a kind of suffering that does little more than resemble shame, wounds pouring from its fingers into the dirt. But the rich won't be persuaded or the poor redressed. The dirt stays inarticulate and human nature propagates exactly as we hedged. Unmoved, I hesitate. In the vicinity of riches, fail again to act. Tell me what to feel as summer swells my appetites, as my appetites feed insatiable regrets. And now this world seems only one of many bitter seeds the wind has gathered, swept along and then haphazard dropped. Commerce must be that that which makes things happen. It gives to take through and for itself. It consummates fatten silence with self applause and never bows to earth as if to stay alive meant to kneel and beg before the question of its own insufferable emptiness. Show me how to feel, teach me what this means or grant me riches, beauty, fame, I'll toss away this body like a coin. And uh, I'll finish with a poem called What the Bees Say. For now at least, I've got it made. I lays inside a field of bees dreaming languages, sands, phonemes. But this is not Elysium or Eden or even the Pyrenees. And when I say the Pyrenees, I don't simply mean tectonic plates subducting and thrusting over geologic time to create that metamorphic thing in and of itself, which once isolated the Iberians from Northern Europe. I just mean a romantic gestures, a sweeping vector, east then west, an illusion that signals vaguely, strangely away, then ends up swinging and pointing back toward its origin, to me, like the tourist at home again, feeling newly arrived yet bothered by the subtlest sense of having never actually left, so do words travel, not in law-abiding lines, but in arcs of eternal recurrence. It's the same whether I say the Atlantic or the Pacific Northwest or Christopher Noel Eric Hutchinson. A name is not a monument, it's a body's tick. Loose tilt of the head, imprecise wave of the arm, the hand flitting up for a moment through space with a sparrow's gift for lift, speed and weightlessness, then dropping down heavy down to earth. And maybe the earth full of tiny bells shifts and chimes, just as the mountainous horizon shimmering like a wall of heat cracks ever so slightly. A syntax of colored lights slivering through the crevice an inchoate form unfolding there briefly before dissolving its figure transmuted into a flicker outside the self and the self too becoming something else, a chorus of vowels melting into the summer sound of bees, the opposite of a hush, this field of energy, this perpetual invocation, stirring, buzzing, questioning, redefining sound's essence. It says, imagine Eden before Adam's facile taxonomy. It asks, what if to name a thing is to encircle and so enshrine the terms of its colonization and death? Better to descend into the valley of making and unmaking, to follow the byways and pathways which are the mind's combinatory networks at once self-contained and endless. 
Here, every poem fails in order to succeed or succeeds by drifting apart, crumbling to phonetic ruins and scattering like clouds of pollen into the richly ruinous ether. And so this insatiable need to write is really a desire sparked from the flint of writing's intrinsic and hopeless contradictions. I mean, extrinsic and hopeful. I mean, there is no true analysis, no analogy without a slipknot, unless, like the very rich, unknowingly clothed in blood-stained silks, I'm just another privileged product of the West, dressed in weeds of indeterminacy and ahistoric decadence. And if language is a game, a front, the ego's jazz instrument, then all this is vanity, conceit's conceit. I admit, silence terrifies me. Yours, yes, but mine most of all. I guess I'd rather be lost and turning somewhere inside my own utterances, like a river dreaming its way through the Pyrenees, or like a cognitive breeze contemplating itself in the grass. This is the life for now at least, or is it, is it, is it, is, 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 go the bees. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. And uh, this brings to a conclusion our event today. Um, I'd like to thank our uh, new Ice House uh, poets, uh, Tanya Bartel, Chris Hutchinson, and Jesse Jones. Um, and you can get their books at your favorite local bookstore. Please do that. Um, thank you for sitting in uh, as Ice House friends, Trini Finley, Sue Sinclair, and Emily Scove Nelson, whose participation was very fondly appreciated. Um, I'd also like to thank Oriana McLaughlin as our tech person today, who kept everything rolling smoothly. And um, if you liked what you heard today, uh, please tune in Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Eastern for the Toronto launch of these books. Um, and that will, uh, the friends sitting in on Wednesday will be uh, poets with the chapbook series of Anne Struther Press. Uh, and so uh, see you all there. And thank you much for tuning in today. Uh, I assume you're a wonderful audience, but I can't see you. <laughs> Take care, everyone.